So, what does the future hold? Just so you know, you're a special audience. Dave, Gary, and I talked about this uh, before. Uh, we're going to take tonight, it's a big surprise, we're going to announce the site of the new hospital tonight. No. <laughs> you ready? <laughs> no, we're not. <laughs> Sorry, if you came here to hear the location of the site of the new hospital, you're at the wrong meeting. Um, we're not doing that. What we're going to talk about is the new hospital, what it brings, or what it will bring for our region, and the benefits, and what else is going on in the province of Ontario. What else is going on in the world with respect to new hospital development um, and the possibilities for us. So what does the future hold? So before we start talking about the new hospital, what we're doing now as an organization, as I stated, we have now the Olette campus and the Met campus for acute care. See, the media is leaving because I announced that we're not on SNS site. So um, we have the Olette campus and the Met campus for Windsor Regional Hospital. And they were governed with two different organizations, but previous to about 18 months ago. So before we start even talking about designing a new hospital, we're at early stages. We're not even into design phase yet at all. What we have to do is what we call standardize and optimize. And we started this process about nine to 10 months ago um, in earnest. And actually, we started it before um, October 1st, 2013, when we re realigned as organizations, knowing this was coming um, and having to develop a plan. The goal is to standardize the operations between both campuses. So you as a patient, when you walk into either campus, the experience you have is the same. We're not moving towards the lowest common denominator for the experience. We're moving towards the highest common denominator. Is we want to have that experience to be outstanding, like our vision, outstanding care, no exceptions. Now, that does a few things. Number one, it creates teamwork. It gets two groups of employees that technically never worked hand in hand to be in the room together and working hand in hand. And it's frontline staff coming up with that standardization. It's not me coming up with this is the way of the world. It's the frontline staff involved. And it's from the patient's perspective. And how do we know it's from the patient's perspective? They're in the room. They're part of the process. And some of them actually are here tonight. They're actually there at the table, talking about from their point of view what their experience is coming into the hospital and what they would like to see from their perspective moving forward. So that's the first thing it does. Second thing it does, it's going to drive the design of the new hospital. We could contact an architect today and he or she could design the most beautiful hospital in the world. Will it be functional? Will it be operational? Might be, might not be. So what we need to do is standardize our operations to the point that they will drive the design. That we will take our operations, which will be brought to best practice, hand it to the architect and say, now you design a hospital around this, not the other way around. And that's what we're doing. It's going to take a lot of work. A lot of organizations, so you know, that have kind of come together and are in the process of moving towards a new hospital, they kind of caught on to this late. We know there's some across the province that are kind of scrambling now. They're into the design phase. Some are already building hospitals and are like, wow, we got to get, eventually we're going to move into this place and work side by side. The last thing we can afford is that when we move into the new facility, to have, for example, two admitting clerks sitting next to each other and saying, well, this is the way I admit a patient at Olette. No, this is the way I admit a patient at Met. No, we've got to have one way, and it's got to be focused on the patient. So that's what we're doing right now, and it focuses on, clearly, people, processes, and results. So with respect to the new hospital planning, as I uh, stated before, um, we're moving ahead with the planning. We're at a very early stage. I'll outline later on how early we are with respect to the process. We're being looked at by the province because they're very interested in how we have re reached out so early on in the process to the community. They're very interested in the fact that 
with the community, we got them involved at a stage with respect to the concept of even site selection, asking the community to be on the site selection committee, having all volunteers, board members, and individuals from the community, because you gotta remember, just like Dave Cook, our board members are volunteers, they're not paid. We put ads in the newspaper and people apply to be on our board. So that's open to the public. Everyone on that site selection committee is volunteers. Not only did we stop there, but then we said to the public in general, we put together the general criteria and we asked the public for feedback. We had over 600 responses with respect to that, providing feedback. That feedback was used to not only modify the criteria, but also weight the criteria that was used in the site selection process. One of the things about the site selection process is we know at the end of the day, wherever this hospital is gonna be located, it's gonna be wrong. And why is it gonna be wrong? Because every single square inch of Windsor, Essex has been suggested for the location of the new hospital. There's gonna be a group out there that wants a new hospital in their backyard, and guess what? It's not gonna be in their backyard. Then there's gonna be a group out there that doesn't want the hospital in the backyard, and what? They're gonna look up, and there's gonna be the hospital. But we gotta move on behind that. Because folks, if we don't, we're gonna lose out. We really are. So I'm now gonna highlight what else is going on in the province of Ontario. And there's little cards that are gonna be available for you if you haven't signed up or haven't gone to this website, it's called windsorhospitalswithans.ca. And I'd ask you to go there because there's a lot of information. I would love to be able to pick all you folks up and go to Humber River, or Humber Valley, Humber, sorry, in Toronto, and see what's going on there. I'd love to pick you up and take you to Oakville. I'd love to pick you up, take you to West Bloomfield, uh, to what Henry Ford's doing. That's just not practical. So what we've done with the help of Allison Johnson, uh, Allison joined the team, and what Allison is doing is she's going out to these facilities, bringing this information back and posting it on the website. So you'll see a lot of informative videos there with respect to what is out there, what's happening. And so you know, folks, in Ontario, what all of you are paying for. You're paying for Humber. You're paying for Oakville. So it's about time Humber, Oakville, the rest of the province pays for us and builds a hospital for Windsor, Essex. So I'm just going to highlight some of the uh, videos, uh, short uh, segments of them. The first video is from Dr. Gary Ng. Dr. Gary Ng is our chief of staff. And Dr. Gary Ng talks about, from a physician's point of view, the pressures that are out there for physicians and, and the attraction for professional staff in different jurisdictions. Remember, a physician can make the same money in Windsor as they're making in Toronto, making in Ottawa. Same amount of money. They want to look at something different. And one of the things is, is one of the things they want to look at is with respect to something different, something like designing being part of the future for the new hospital. And one of the great examples, um, and I, sorry Jane, I'm going to pick on you here. Uh, Jane Boyd's here. Um, and uh, Jane knows this, is uh, we were recruiting some young urologists uh, to the city after the uh, unfortunate passing of Jane's uh, husband. Um, and uh, he had actually tried, started recruiting them uh, before he passed. And these guys were interested in Windsor, in Windsor Regional Hospital, and they were interested because they were looking towards the future. They were saying they wanted to be part of something exciting. They wanted to be part of looking towards designing and building a new state-of-the-art hospital. They could practice urology wherever. But they picked Windsor, and they picked Windsor on that dream and that vision, and they picked Windsor for also the men's health program. And lo and behold, we get the men's health program in a Da Vinci robot. There's only 20, 25 of them across Canada. So these guys came, and I really appreciate Jane and clearly Dr. Boyd uh, for his leadership in that regard, but that gives you an idea. So what Gary talks about is what else is out there, what the pressures are, and what attracts people, and what happens if technically we do nothing. 
If we do nothing, that would be uh, very risky in terms of the uh, evolution of uh, healthcare. Uh, it will go backward uh, because once we are stagnant, uh, we'll stand to lose uh, what we have uh, in terms of physicians, nurses, and other healthcare providers because there are other medical centers that will be, they would love to have some of our physician staff from here. So what I'm going to highlight now, I'm going to go across the province of Ontario and look at what's been going on basically over the last, say, five, eight years with respect to hospital redevelopment and kind of highlight some of the things or all of the things, a lot of the things on the internet site, windsorhospitals.ca, and just highlight some of the, uh, some of the videos. So here's a map of our lovely uh, province of Ontario. And uh, the first uh, hospital I am going to highlight is Humber River Hospital. Now, Humber River is uh, similar in size uh, to what we're looking at. It's going to be opening actually uh, up this year. And uh, one of the things that Humber River focuses on is in our two acute care hospitals right now, out of our bed structure, we have approximately 20% of our beds are private rooms. 80% are not private. And when you look at new hospital design today, new hospital design talks about actually the reverse, is you should have 80% private, 20% semi or wards. The reasons for that are multiple, infection control issues, patient comfort, allowing families to spend more time with their loved ones in the hospital. Our infrastructure today doesn't support that. Now, over at the Prince Road, with Hotel Du Grace Healthcare, what was developed at that campus is this 80% private rooms at that campus. And that was in design for that. One of the huge benefits, because I can tell you, I pretty much on a daily basis, I get phone calls from family members saying, and from patients, could you please get me out of this room, this semi-private or ward room, put me in a private room, because I can't stand my roommate, he's snoring all night, he's making noise all night, I came into the hospital to get better and I'm getting worse because I can't sleep. Or number two is, I'm having family come and visit me and there is zero room in the room. My dad, um, about a year ago, had his hip replaced and um, he was at Olette and he was in a semi-private room, pretty much, I mean, I'm a pretty big guy, but I went in the room and visiting my dad with his friend uh, his neighbor, and um, when the physician and the nurse had to come in, I had to leave the room to give them room to get into the room. It's just not workable. So the chief operating officer, Humber River, talks about what's in their design for their patient rooms. 80% of our patient rooms, so it's almost all of them, have a three-piece bathroom, a single patient room, and a family area. And this is great news from an infection control standpoint. You are no longer sharing a bedroom, sharing a bathroom, and breathing the air of somebody else who might have some kind of an infection. But not only that, our rooms are created such that the families become part of the stay. And if they wish to stay with a family member, there's a sleeping area, there's a little family alcove, it's got its own lighting, a plug to plug your computer in. So we think that that's going to be a much more comfortable environment for our patients and their families. So one of the benefits also um, outlined, as you can see in that little area there, is for family members to stay with their loved one 24-7, have their own sleeping area to be with their loved one. Can't do that today unless you want to sleep on a chair, um, but you're not reclining uh, in order to do that. Now, in our private rooms, you have that ability somewhat, but definitely not in the other rooms, not at all. So it's not comfortable. Family can't be with their loved ones right now. And again, for the patient comfort issues, um, as indicated. And one of the things is, New hospital construction, even for the semi-private and the ward rooms, and forgive me now if I offend you with this, but the rule from an, if this infection control practitioner said this is the rule and this is the lingo they use, it's one butt per toilet. So in semi-private rooms, each patient in that room, even though they're in a semi-private room, has their own toilet. They don't share a toilet. Toilets are the quickest way. We could have someone there cleaning them 24-7. It's the quickest way to spread infection. Ward rooms, 
port toilets for patients. That's new hospital infrastructure. That's the environment we live in. That's the environment that continues from an infection control point of view, continues to morph um, into that. So another project uh, that happened uh, back in 2011 is North Bay Health Center. Um, another project that happened in the province, William Osler, uh, back in 2011. Another project, a little closer to home if you've been there, it's uh, actually quite a phenomenal expansion they did, is uh, Blue Water Health. Um, another project is uh, Halton Healthcare opening this year, uh, about the same size of what uh, we're looking at as a, uh, as a facility. And also I'm going to take a stop here, we're going to focus on uh, the next one, which is the uh, Niagara Health System uh, that uh, was opened in uh, 2012. Now, one of the great things about Niagara that I wanted to highlight, and this is kind of the question sometimes we get asked, and so you know this presentation has evolved over time in about the 30 times we've done it, uh, based upon a lot of the feedback we get, we try to, you know, and same with the internet site, try to update information with respect to the feedback to hear from the community and, and engage the community, get their feedback, and provide the information. So one of the things we focused on is Niagara Health System. Um, they came together, there was I think three hospitals that were brought together to, uh, to build this particular facility. And one of the concerns in the community at the time in Niagara was, wow, if you ever had some type of outbreak, if you're in one facility, aren't we kind of like limiting our ability to operate in this one facility? Actually, and I don't mean to scare people, but it's quite the contrary. The way our facilities, the infrastructure we have now, if there's an outbreak that occurs at one of our facilities, there's no way we're going to be able to keep it contained within that facility, let alone spread possibly to the other one. It's just impossible. Not going to happen. The way they're being built now in Niagara is going to highlight is the issue with respect to air handling systems and the fact that in a hospital, now they build them that you segregate the different areas of the hospital and they have different air handling systems. And that way, if you have something occurring in one part of that hospital, you can still operate the rest of the hospital without having to worry about the spread of that to other parts of the hospital. So Niagara focused on that. The first video, though, they're going to they're talk about this concept. So you know when, uh, before I get to the, the second video on Niagara, is going to focus on that. The first video on Niagara is going to focus on the issue we have currently when patients come in from the community and the lack of access to these private rooms. What the staff have to do on a daily basis is like a Ouija board trying to figure out where these patients are going to go. Because unfortunately, a lot of the patients come in from the community with community infections. And some of them, we have to assume they are going to have an infection until it's ruled out. As a result, we do our best to segregate them. But when we only have 20% of our private rooms, most of them are taken up, well, all of them are taken up actually right now, with respect to patients that either brought in an infection or unfortunately got an infection at the hospital. The rest, we have to kind of, kind of segregate as best we can in semi-private or ward rooms. So the first video I'm uh, going to highlight is from an infection control specialist at Niagara who has that 80% private, 20% semi, and she talks about the benefits of it from an admission point of view and not having to move patients around on a daily basis trying to accommodate people in order to facilitate trying to not have a spread of infection. As professionals, we all reference the best practice documents, but usually have to make adjustments with the older facilities to make them work. Here, those processes work, and those processes are established into the build. My favorite feature is the 80% single patient rooms. It enables you to put the right patient into the right bed at the right time. So what can happen is you can have a patient here in ED who develops or comes in with an infection that we need to put in additional precautions. And it enables us to place them in that room right away rather than cohorting them very closely to other patients. 
Patients are safer here now? Absolutely. The trend is down on transmission of antibiotic resistant organisms and uh, organisms such as C. difficile. So again, the next video is going to highlight this concept of the air handling systems at the same uh, facility. So one of the design features of this building is that the front end of the building is all ambulatory and as you move deeper into the organization, the intensity or acuity of the patients increases. So at the very back end of the hospital is all the acute care areas, at the front end is all the ambulatory care areas. Um, what that allows us to do is separate the front end of the hospital and continue to provide ambulatory care if there's an outbreak and we need to isolate the back end of the hospital uh, for infectious diseases. If you think back to SARS in uh, uh, 10 years ago, uh, one of the issues that arose then is that hospitals were, were basically closed and, and, and they could look after patients, inpatients, but they couldn't or, or they weren't able to look after uh, ambulatory care patients. In this organization, you can actually isolate the two because things like cancer care or kidney care require frequent visits to the hospital and you can't not do them in an mm -hmm. outbreak. So some other projects uh, that have taken place. There's multiple. Mississauga, Burlington, Cambridge, Markham, Hamilton, London, Oshawa, Kingston, Belleville, Peterborough, just to name a few. The one thing all those have in common is the fact that everyone in this room paid their share towards building all that. So it's about time all that pays its share towards building a state-of-the-art acute care hospital for Windsor-Essex because again we deserve nothing less as a community because I can tell you if we don't move along with this process there's other jurisdictions out there that would love to build a new acute care hospital and jump ahead of us in the queue. For example, Ottawa. The city of Ottawa has assembled some land. They want a new acute care hospital. Where are they at right now? They're behind us in the queue. We start getting caught up, and the politicians have been great with respect to saying this. We can't get caught up, folks, in where this hospital is going to be. We have to trust the site selection committee and the work they've done and trust that and move forward because we deserve nothing less. And I know we're going to be proud of their work. I know it's going to be good. Again, is it going to be perfect? No. Are we going to make 100% of the people happy? No. But we can't have nothing less for our patients, for our families, for our staff to have this. Now, one of the videos is uh, Dr. Um, uh, Jerry Cooper. Jerry is uh, at the Windsor program of the Schulich Medical School and Jerry talks about the benefits of a new acute care hospital from a learner's perspective. The current facilities in Windsor in terms of the hospitals, they meet the needs but just barely. We're certainly looking ahead to uh, that day hopefully will come that we have a new uh, brand new physical plant here in Windsor. It, well it would mean the world to uh, to our learners, to our faculty members, uh, it would certainly be a shot in the arm for for conducting research here as well. You know you, you need you need space to do these things and you need the proper equipment and we don't always have those things at our disposal at the present time. So um, one of the other things that has come up some in some of our uh, sessions is this concept of the size of the property we're looking at. And, you know, unlike being in, say, Manhattan or Toronto or Chicago or Buffalo or Vancouver, we're in Windsor. And what we have to look at is serving our region. And that's what the ministry made it very clear. We are a regional hospital for our region. So as a result, one of the things that they want to look at, too, from a planning perspective, is they don't want hospitals to be build a new hospital and then be landlocked when you've got to develop it in 20 years, 15, 20 years. 
and be stuck. They don't want to do that anymore. They've been there. If you have the ability, they want you to have the ability to expand on the existing piece of property, as well as look to the future. Because again, we get one shot at this, folks. This is not something the ministry wants to revisit in 50 years from now and say, oh, guess what, Windsor-Essex, you get a, another new acute care hospital, go through this process again and pick another site. They want to be able to say the site that you select now is not only good for 10 years from now, but it's going to be good for 20, 30, 40, 50 years from now. So you've got to look out with respect to that. So one of the areas uh, that we highlight, one of the videos is uh, from Oakville, and the uh, uh, main planner for Oakville site talks about the property that was used there and the reasons uh, that the ministry now looks at with respect in Ontario to have the capacity to grow without disruption to operations is critically important and having the capacity in land mass, having capacity in building mass to do that intelligently, you're spending the right amount of money at the right time versus uh, too much too late. I think that uh, having the capacity to grow to 702 beds which we have on this site would protect the, the health care for this community well into uh, the future. So I'm going to come back, I'm going to hand it over now to Gary Switzer who's going to be talking about the community capacity plan and the work that's going on um, through the LIN and with a bunch of community agencies. And then I'm going to talk about something that we're also going to be making part of that community capacity plan um, where I said earlier we're going to highlight on emergency services. I'm going to kind of focus on that for a bit. So Gary.